There are two prayers that I remember from childhood. One, we would say nightly around the dinner table. God, thank you for the food we eat. Thank you for the world so sweet. Thank you for the birds that sing. Thank you, God, for everything. Amen. Did anyone else say that prayer or a version of it? Yes, I see several heads nodding. And the other one was at bedtime. God, I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Amen. A little scary, exactly, right? I, I mentioned that later, yeah. As I say that now, I'm like, yeah, that soul to take part, that's a little scary, right? A little troubling, yeah. Yeah, I would uh, definitely reframe that now in my, uh, in my older years. <laughs> now, I don't remember who taught me these prayers or when I started saying them, but obviously at 42 years old, I'm, oh, 41, I'm not 42 yet, uh, they have stuck. I remember these prayers even if I might not remember my age. They have shaped my understanding of God and my approach to meals and creation and life, all of it, with a deep sense of gratitude and trust. Now, as I said, obviously these prayers aren't perfect in their simplicity, though I don't think perfection is something that we should strive for or that's even possible in our prayer life. When I was in seminary, I uh, had a professor, my, my worship professor, and we would get graded for our prayers in class. Right. And this wasn't pass-fail or like check mark, complete. It was A, B, C, D, F. I know. <laughs> exactly. I had a colleague who I worked with, and she could not wrap her head around this concept. And oftentimes on Sunday morning, she would tease me after worship, and she'd come up and say, hmm, I think that was a B, maybe a B minus. And she's right. Grading a prayer doesn't make sense, especially when we approach prayer as an open-ended conversation with God, a time to speak, a time to listen, a time to center ourselves to be open, and to just be. There's not a right or a wrong way to do it. It looks different for each and every one of us. But I'm grateful that I learned these prayers, even if I might switch the wording up a bit, especially on that soul to take part. You know, they are ingrained in my mind because of the repetitiveness of that ritual, starting at a young age. And even when I came home from college, we would still say that prayer around the dinner table. When I do, I can just feel the sigh of relief and a sense of peace come over me. What we do is connected to what we think. And prayer as a product of our thinking is a form of communication first to ourselves, then to God, and then to those who overhear us. So what are we communicating with our prayers? It is pretty clear in the scripture today that the writer is trying to communicate to the early church, may you be rooted and grounded in love. A love that is beyond what we could possibly imagine. A love that can accomplish far more than we can do on our own. This love is our glue it holds us together. It's our life breath. 
It is the simplest lesson from Jesus. Love God. Love neighbor. Period. And as we know, it's the most difficult to master. Amen? This prayer, rooted and grounded in love, is one that I have found myself saying often lately. May I, may we be rooted and grounded in love. May we be rooted and grounded in love. May we be rooted and grounded in love. In everything we say and everything that we do, may they know we belong to you by the way we love each other. What if this was the message that we said over and over and over again to start our day around the dinner table before we laid our heads on the pillow at night. May we be rooted and grounded in love. May we be rooted and grounded in what is beyond our imagination. May we be rooted and grounded in the possibility of what God can do. How would this unfold in our lives? May we be rooted and grounded in love when we walk out the door in the morning. May we be rooted and grounded in love in our email correspondence and our interaction with coworkers and family and friends and fellow congregants. May we be rooted and grounded in love in how we listen and how we lead. May we be rooted and grounded in love when we see a neighbor in need. May we be rooted and grounded in love when peace doesn't seem possible. May we be rooted and grounded in love when hate is the easier choice. May we be rooted and grounded in love when hope seems lost. May we be rooted and grounded in love with every breath we take. May we be rooted and grounded in love. The number of messages that we receive daily is staggering and constantly increasing with the rise of smartphones and social media and email and text messages. The average person, and you can all attest to this, we are bombarded with messages. Amen? It's overwhelming. This prayer, this prayer is another message. You know, what are the, the messages that are getting the most airtime on our playlist? What are the ones that we hear or we tell ourselves over and over again? What do we start our day with? What message do we start our day with? What is the message that pops in our head when things don't go our way? Or when we find ourselves getting mad at someone or something? Our scripture reading feels a bit like a benediction. A benediction is a sending forth, a final blessing that helps us bring to a close worship or a meeting or a retreat or a gathering, and it sends us out into the world with the holy reminder of who we are and our call. Candace Simpson describes a benediction as a cosmic bridge between one space and the next, holding us in both places at once. This prayer in the third chapter of Ephesians is a transition text in the letter. It links the theological section, chapters 1 through 3, which we've talked about the last three weeks, what God has done in uniting all things in Christ and breaking down divisions, with the application section, 
chapters 4 through 6, which will start next week. How we respond to this gift of God's love and God's call for unity. It is a sending forth for the work ahead. May we be rooted and grounded in love. You know, it's funny how the Spirit works sometimes. Months ago, when we were planning this worship series on Ephesians, I had no idea that this week's scripture, this prayer, would be the same Sunday as our blessing of the backpacks. Two prayers, centuries apart, with the same theme. These backpack tags are a holy reminder for our kiddos. Not just that we are praying with them and for them. These tags are ascending forth that goes with our students as they head to school each and every day. Be loved. Be kind. Be you. What if they heard that every single morning? What if they saw this throughout the day? How would this message shape them in kindergarten and first grade and fifth grade and eighth grade and senior year? What if they knew this prayer when they went off to college or entered the workforce? Be loved, be kind, be you. How would it shape them? How would it shape the people that they interact with? How would that message transform our world? I don't know about you, but I could use a tangible reminder like this in my life. Maybe hang it from my purse strap, or better yet, attach it to my cell phone somehow when I receive and send all those messages, be love, be kind, be you, or maybe plastered to my computer screen on a hot pink post-it note. What if rooted and grounded in love became our daily mantra, our backpack tag, our prayer that we could recite with ease, shaping our decisions, our interactions, our relationships, from morning greetings to late night reflections, this phrase, rooted and grounded in love, could be the heartbeat of our lives, a practical, transforming message of God's boundless, liberating love. May it be so. Amen.